Welcome to the Wicked Podcast, where we read the business books you don't have the time for. I'm Marcus Kirsch. And I'm Troy Norcross. And we are your co-hosts for the Wicked Podcast. We take from the thousands of business books out there and test the author's ideas by comparing them to real-world challenges. With over 40 years of projects between us, we've got quite a bit to compare against. We give you the condensed takeaways, followed by our interview with the authors. We know you want actions, not theories, and it's actions that we want to help shape, because that's what the Wicked Podcast is all about, helping you to become a wicked company. So, Marcus, I'm in Portugal today, and I know you hate the fact that I've got a beautiful pool, but I'm still here for our podcast. So, who are we talking to? Yeah, keep rubbing it in my face, seriously. <laughs> um, I'm sitting here in a little cardboard box in London in my Let's call it an office. So, yes, we have Bruce Daisley and his book, The Joy of Work. He used to be working at Twitter, and he's got some interesting views on how we can create a working culture that is just better, more effective, and better to people. And I think a lot of his ideas are, are, are really good. They're very employee-centric. Although, to be candid, I haven't had a proper job, a proper J-O-B in a long time. Most of the stuff that I've been doing and what you've been doing you know, in the last 10 years has been all contract work. So I'm really interested to kind of dive into how do these things work, not just to direct employees, but also to contract employees. Absolutely. And I think to maybe um, preempt sort of asking you for insights, I think one of the uh, things I took away from, so, you know, he recognizes that collaboration and challenging things is sort of, might have two sides to it. You know, we talked and we, we talked in the interview a little bit about the difference between leaders and a collaborative effort and that they needs to be changed. And I think it's one of the things that truly needs to happen. Review how the dynamics in the team work and uh, who is contributing how, I think was definitely well, sort of my my one of my points to take away. What were you? What did you take away? So I, I was really glad that we had the discussion about busy for the sake of being busy and how that's really not adding any incremental value and how we can possibly kind of reframe that to actually focus not on, as he said, so much the inputs, which is the number of meetings that we attend or the number of emails that we write, but to focus on the outputs and how all of the pandemic and all of the work from home trends are driving people more in that. So I was I was really happy about that. Um, the, the speaking up and the, the loud voice. I mean, there are a lot of people that speak up just to make sure that they are heard. They're trying to build their own brand value, even when they have nothing to say. But all, equally, you have people, you know, sometimes who are not the most high up in the organization, like he talks about the receptionist, who actually was able to change the entire culture of a company because she was well-respected, because she spoke clearly, and because she resonated with a lot of the people. So I think it's it's interesting to see when people are just speaking to be speaking and when they're actually adding value. Yeah, and it, it definitely shows for people power as well. I think, you know, that uh, interesting or the innovation or improvement can come from anywhere. But that also gets me to um, one of my other takeaways, which is when we talked about, um, you know, really looking at how we communicate, how we have meetings, how we work now from home in these post-COVID times. And I just had my first onboarding um, in a new project just purely on Zoom, and there was just so much stuff missing. And it reminded me of the survey I did a couple of weeks back where a lot of people are missing essential bits and pieces that you don't have in an office. So we talked a bit about the office with him, but I think one of the things he definitely said, and I think I would urge companies to do is take time step aside go and ask people how they feel about working from home the times that are being being taken to have the meetings the times you have to put your head down and do your work because i saw a lot of responses from people who are suffering either by the amount of work because it's not effective or efficient anymore because there's too many meetings or just how those times interfere with actually being able to focus on work and actually get anything done rather than just sit in meetings. So, uh, yeah, so I, that, that it's a great take takeaway for me to really go and look at. Let's review this. Now is the time to really figure out how differently we can do this and how much better we can do this. And a related takeaway for me was the reframing of work. I mean, back in the, you know, 100 years ago, you all went to the same workshop and you could see exactly how many widgets you produced per hour and the quality of each widget. These days, it's thought work. 
and it's much harder to actually see the quality and the quantity of work and work is not really done specifically in a particular place. It can be done just about anywhere. So part of this reframing in the work from home and the pandemic and the, the mixed office and non office environment is both a challenge and an opportunity for organizations to grow. Yeah, and I think there's yeah the measuring of that is quite a tricky one, and I really would, really would like to do a very specific episode on that to look at how do we measure things. So if anybody out there knows a book about uh, measuring not just the quantitative aspect but the qualitative aspect of how teams and dynamics work and what what organizations should be looking at, I would be really happy to to do an episode on that. And it reminds me a bit on. Um, what we talked with Joel Pine about when he talks about experiences and experiences are very qualitative, they're not quantitative because they're very emotional. He's got a new model of measuring that value. And I wonder if you can apply the same value, not just to customer experiences, but actually to internal team experiences and see if they're doing well and see if the value created by them is working or if people are breaking, right? And, and this kind of goes to one of my favorite things, and, and I, I say this a few times and people kind of really resonate with it, that as a consultant, I stopped selling days of my life several years ago. Now I'm selling results. And it's much harder to deal with the client at the beginning and establish what is the outcome that you want and agree the measure. But that's the most valuable bit, because if you really know what's being measured, you know what you need to do to be able to deliver it, regardless of whether it takes you one day or 20. Yeah, and I think that's quite crucial, isn't it? Because that then reminds me of going to uh, any organization, having a look at what do you want to do, what do you want to achieve, and they go, "No, just do it." We don't que- we don't question the problem. We just go and try to solutionize, right? So to be able to step back and 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 re-explore the problem, if the problem really is the problem, or if the details of the problem are still relevant, instead of just going, "No, you're gonna do that," and we already know how to measure it. How do you know, right? And when we talk to uh, 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 Richard Chatterway as well in behavior, you know, about uh, behavioral science, he says a lot of the solutions are not intuitive. So it's worth to step back and look at it from a point of view you might have not considered. So to hear different voices and look at it differently, to actually be surprised, because that's the biggest value. The obvious stuff everyone does, and the obvious stuff is not that effective. So the obvious stuff, the thing that's right in front of you on second number five when you start working on something, it's likely not what's going to make you more competitive or better or improves anything. It's actually really more valuable to dig a bit more into what it is. And I think Einstein or someone also said, you know, if I would have any problem, I would spend uh, 90% or 95% of my time trying to understand it and then 5% on the solution, not the other way around. And a lot of organizations still seem to do that the other way around. And they admit they don't understand the problem. And they admit that they're failing with their solutions on and on again. So somewhere there needs to be a shift in focus, I think. You're absolutely right. And if we keep going on like this, we're going to miss the interview. So uh, let's, let's shift our focus to the interview. Yes, let's. So welcome, everyone, uh, to the Wicked Podcast. Today we have Bruce Daisley here and his book, The Joy of Work. Uh, welcome, Bruce, and thank you for making time. Thank you so much for having me. Let's dive straight in. It's a really fascinating book. It's a lot about how we work and how we have uh, how we can create a better workplace. Um, tell us a bit to start with uh, what made you write The Joy of Work. Yeah, I, um, for a long time, worked at Twitter. I ran uh, Twitter's European operations out of London and uh, prior to that I'd worked at YouTube and I'd always been fascinated with the the working cultures of uh, different firms and you know in fact I'll be honest with you when I first got the opportunity to go and work at tech firms I think we're told so often that tech firms have got better cultures than the rest of the world and they uh, they do certain things better and so as a result of that I was really intrigued to go and work inside the tech firm and see you know, see how the sausage was made. And um, I think, you know, what I discovered was firstly, tech firms have no advantage over the rest of us. But then in addition, um, what I discovered was that I I was fortunate enough that because I joined Twitter fairly early in their their operations, there was probably 300, 400 people when I joined Twitter um, globally, that I was able to help shape the culture. And what I found was that 
initially I was able to shape the culture and maybe we're, we're able to shape the cultures more easily of small companies. But as time went on, um, a few things started to go wrong. And I was just really interested in, for myself, finding an instructional guide, a guide that was going to tell me how to fix the, the workplace culture in my organization. And I, I just struggled to find anything. And I found as time went on, my demand for this, my desire for a book like this was was growing. And so um, really, I just decided to write it myself. So I was just interested in how I could fix my own workplace culture. And I set about thinking, how could I write the, the book, the guide that I struggled to find? Lovely. Yeah, there's a lot of different things in the book and it's because it's obviously quite a complex subject matter to look at work culture and ways of working um so you know to pick up maybe one of them you know people uh people people always say that they're quite they're quite busy right and so um and you reference one behavior that says you know men don't volunteer for things because they're too busy and uh, being busy doesn't help other people and so on and it's always a bit tricky to say, well, you know, I have a full job and I'm uh, really busy. But on the other side, I want to be contributing uh, across the organization. So tell us a bit more of, you know, that particular fact and how we can maybe reframe the term being busy. Yeah, well, I think hurry sickness is something that afflicts afflict all of us. We find ourselves constantly beset with the demands upon us and uh, a, a, and the guilt comes from it. So, you, you know, we often find that we'll get to the end of the day and we'll feel guilty that we haven't got back to, to colleagues or that we still have a lot of emails that we've left unread. And so we find ourselves in a constant state of sort of anxiety that we, we're not really doing our job effectively. And I think it's a state of mind as much as anything. The We often find ourselves, you know, it's very easy for any of us to spend all day in our jobs on our emails or to spend all day in our jobs uh, on Zoom meetings these days and then on emails. And I think what we discover is that, that actually it's often in service of us not really achieving anything, not really getting anything done. So I think that hurry sickness is probably something that to some degree is toxic. It's it's a toxic um expectation on us it's a top, toxic demand on us i'm really taken i guess you know this year has seen the most extraordinary disruption to the world of work and extraordinary disruption to the way that any of us are working and I, i'm really taken with trying to understand what can any of us do to try to improve the way that we're configuring work improve the way that we're we're trying to set about answering these questions and it just, you know, it strikes me that the more you look into this, the more there are plenty of examples of firms who just do things in a very different way, who set about trying to maybe reduce the demands upon their workers or create um, cre create demands in different ways. So I think, you know, I'm really fascinated and intrigued with how any of us can can maybe set about trying to sort of reconfigure the way that we're we're working right now. But to, to spin off on that in a, in a different direction, I know people that brag about how busy they are. Oh, my God, I'm just so busy. I'm busy. I'm busy. And it's almost a justification for their job. And I think the more, in, for lack of a better phrase, the more enlightened people are saying, there's no reason for you to be that busy. You're not prioritizing well. You're not working efficiently. You're creating busyness because you desire to be busy. And that's what I'm, I'm trying to help people understand that being busy these days doesn't carry any any status at all. You actually want to be managing work more effectively, saying no and only saying yes to the right things and being more efficient. And that's what I mean when I say, can we reframe this busyness and look at how are we actually delivering value? What kind of results are we getting rather than the, the action of sitting on the hamster wheel? Yeah, very much so. And I think a lot of us, if we were to use the metaphor of, of other industries and other sports, it's easier to see the the deception that we're, we're bringing about. If any of us were, you know, we right now would be sitting right in the middle of the Tokyo Olympics. So if, if any of us were to sit there and say, um, 
an athlete was to come to us and tell us their training regime. And their training regime was 60 hours of training a week. I think a lot of us would say, okay, that seems a lot. You sure that's the, the right amount to, to maximise our performance. And of course, you know, we'd recognise in other sports that that's the case. And I was really struck by um, when people look into the way that they actually do their job and they, they optimise performance for it, they often come to very different results. So let me give you specifics. Well, what we discover is that if we want to be more creative, more imaginative, then being perpetually busy, being in a state of constantly being overloaded, seems to be uh, destructive rather than productive. I, I was really intrigued looking into some sort of rudimentary neuroscience. And you look into the rudiments of neuroscience, and broadly the, uh, what comes back is that people say that if you, um, if you look into the way that the brain works, these, these sort of three broad systems of cognition. The first one is the executive attention network, and that's what we're paying to at any moment, paying attention to at any moment. It's the main thing we're doing. The second one is the salience network. So while the executive attention network is is doing is writing an email, the salience network will be just checking that the the room that we're in is a safe room room to be in. But then the third network is um, is called the default mode or the default network, and it's broadly. Uh, as we've sort of learned, and it's over the last twenty years, we've we've got more sophisticated with scanning brains. We've we've observed that this area of the brain, this default network, seems to light up when we're not doing things, when we're we're not occupied. But the interesting thing is that we discover that people tend to have their best ideas not in that state of focus and concentration, but in a state of unfocus and and sort of when they're when they're doing far less when their brain is daydreaming when they're drifting off and it's really interesting my favorite example of this is that there's a very uh, successful screenwriter american screenwriter called aaron sorkin and he realized he was having his best ideas for things to happen in his films and his tv shows he realized he was having his best ideas not when he was sitting at his computer screen but when he was in the shower he said he installed a shower in the corner of his office and he has <laughs> six to eight showers a day. So it's just a good wow. reminder, you know, that if someone tells you, if someone tells you they're busy all the time, then it may well be that, yes, they're busy, but they're not allowing their brain to activate, activate the default mode, the, the sort of creative, imaginative part of cognition. Yeah, I mean, this is just, just, just so much in there. And I think um, uh, two, two things to that one, because the athlete thing rings quite, nicely back to uh, when we talked to Jeff Colvin about constant learning he said you know actually you're really improving things and you're, 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 you're creating more value by through learning when you actually step back and check what you just did so you're actually not working on anything and he said if an athlete a high performer plays a game let's say of tennis he's actually not improving anything so if he does his work he's actually not improving he's improving in between training sessions stepping back taking a break, having a look at what did I just do and then focus and do things again. But essentially, it's a stepping back is the thing mm. where you really progress and not the 10,000 hours you put in. If you don't put the right breaks in, that's an, an, and it also reminds me of um, that uh, Netflix documentary, um, Game Changers, about uh, uh, plant protein. But it actually talks a lot about when they talk about athletes, they talk about uh, recovery time, right? So if you become more efficient, when you actually have a better recovery time. So recovery time becomes quite important because if you if you overstretch your muscles, and that must be true for the brain, Absolutely. you're actually you're totally crashing at some point and you're damaging yourself, right? To the point where you can't do your work anymore. And we seen we see this obviously with burnouts and those kind of things. And uh, I'm I'm curious what you think about um I've worked in the creative sector for a long time. I'm quite aware that the more tired you are, the less creative you are. And the more stuff you put on, the less creative you are. Because as you said, the ideas come in the oddest of context and rather away from things than actually in the middle, right in front of what you're supposed to be producing. But the other side, and you know, I, I used to work as a coder as well. And we know that a lot of organizations are very digital. There's tons of agile and 
code being produced, being measured in the time by the amount of lines of code you can produce, which is a very silly way of measuring things. But, you know, that's what some companies are still doing. They look mm. at how many hours put people in, how much code's been written, how, therefore how much value has been produced. That's what they call value rather than like a creative stepping back, going for a walk, and then coming back with some great ideas. And I would even argue... Having been a coder, code is so complex and there's all these different design patterns you apply in code that, that actually, if you structure your code better, you step back from what you actually need to, from the lines of code and go, hang on a second, how can we structure this better so that it's smarter and it's more efficient and effective for the future when we keep coding t stuff on top of it is really, really valuable. But you only do that when you actually step back. And I think there's this other research that's shown, you know, when people have developed these kind of two people coding teams basically to bring two opinions and a conversation into before you write a piece of code and it's been very effective writing better code so just head down and just producing 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 has is, is, has been proving everywhere from athletes to code to creativity it's not being a really smart thing to do can you talk a little bit about that this, this why yeah. organizations still measure maybe the wrong way and not measure the the other thing that seems to be quite valuable but the challenge, of course, is that w when we go back and we compare the work when it was in factories or work when it was in workshops, it was very easy to, to measure both the quality of the work and the output of the work. And so someone who was working in an environment where they were creating tables or chairs or, or plates, you could measure how effectively they were working. And the challenge, of course, of knowledge work is that it's very difficult to both measure the output and to measure the quality of the work. It's sort of, it's, it's rather more uh, complex. It's, it's, a, it's an, un, an imprecise uh, thing to measure. And so as a consequence of that, one of the things we found, even when we be believe that we're enlightened, one of the things we found is that we tend to measure input rather than output. So the amount of times that someone is available, how quickly they reply to our emails, how uh, active they are online, how many meetings they have. We, we tend to measure those things because they, in our head, they act as a good proxy for the work that people are doing. And the evidence suggests that's not the case. There was, um, there was a wonderful example of this I gave in the book, which is a professor at Yale wanted to see how much time his assignments were taking. And he was intrigued with this because some people, I think some some students asked him, how long should I expect to spend on these uh, assignments? And he had no idea. And so he asked, his, uh, he, he asked his pupils how long they were spending. And what he discovered was that the, the best pupils, uh, the, the fastest pupils and the slow pupils were spending an order of 10, 10 times different amount of time. Some were spending... 30, 30 minutes, some were spending six hours, whatever it was, it was, it was a, a big order of magnitude difference. And, uh, and so then he went on and he looked and he compared the amount of time spent to the quality of work. And he found there was no correlation uh, between the amount of time spent and the quality of work. So he was just intrigued with this. And in fact, what we've discovered when we look into work is that the ratio is, um, is even more complex. So uh, Jeff Sutherland, who's the really one of the, the uh, creators of, of Agile, of, of Scrum methodology, he discovered that the, uh, the amount of work taken in project teams can be an order of magnitude of 10, 20 times more and uh, with the same output. And I think any of us, when we've sat in meetings that have had uh, several weeks of review meetings and we feel like we've made these decisions before, then we might, <laughs> we might recognize that sometimes the amount of work taken on a project isn't necessarily a reflection of how good the output is. So I think, you know, there are big questions that any of us need to answer. I think the changes this year, the fact that a lot of us are working remotely, has to some extent forced us to consider some of these things. It's forced us to consider um, what people are actually meant to be doing, what, what a day's work looks like. And it sort of it forced us to think a little bit more about what we genuinely want our teams to do rather than um, rather than how long we want them sitting at their desk. So I think, you know, it, it's not been a bad moment in history because it's encouraged us to really take a pause and, and think more specifically about what we're trying to achieve. 
I'm yeah, and I think, uh, go on, Marcus. Sorry, go ahead. No, cheers. Um, yeah, I think that especially talking about the office, because there's so many different aspects of uh, especially interaction and perception and assumptions. Um, so, you know, uh, Roy Sutherland said somewhere that uh, the office was at some point actually just a place you went for to make photocopies and did expensive phone calls you didn't want to pay for. So it was just a very functional kind of service, uh, a place to go and do these things. It was not a, a place for people to spend hours and hours sitting there doing things um and and with that comes expecting people to be on the desk and being there and but also interacting in the office so small interactions are quite important so now that we're all at home and revisiting that how do you see sort of a potential new relevancy for the office what do you think it's still great for what do you think it's just not needed for anymore maybe yeah, I, I think this is probably the big discussion of the year. So, you know, I'm really taken with the work of someone called Anthony Slumbers. And Anthony Slumbers is a really a sort of a property, a real estate expert. And he's been talking for a long time about how um, we've we've made a few mistakes in the way we think about the office. So he said, he says, most companies didn't want an office. They wanted a productive workforce. And the office was just one of the ways that we could accomplish that. And so it's a really interesting reframing because what it forces us to do to think about um, what do we want an office for? Now, most of us, um, the office performs a function. So it might well be if you're a sales team, the office helps you generate higher energy levels. It allows the team to iterate on their, uh, their sales pitch, it allows the team to really sort of get into an extrovert, a state of extroversion. And to the office accomplishes as a specific task. And it could well be that going forwards, sales teams have a very different pattern of using offices to research teams or to teams who maybe are responsible for um, collecting, collecting debts and, and managing finances. You can see very different patterns. And, and we've never really thought about that specifically. So Anthony Slumbers talks a lot about these things. And I think, the you know, these a lot of us are going to be the companies we're working in. The way that we respond to this remote working change is going to be shaped to some extent by our bosses. Our bosses, in some cases, will be very willing to uh, to embrace a different change. In other cases, our bosses will be the, the main voice in the room saying, I want to return to the way that things used to be. And um, and our bosses will sort of determine the outcome. But it Almost what's what's guaranteed to be the case is that if some firms now don't jump on uh, this experiment and take advantage of remote working, it's almost certain that other firms will follow and will do so. And so then, you know, you might be a recruitment firm. And if you say that you're going to persist with with having offices, well, there's no doubt there'll be a competitor who comes into your space in in six months, 12 months time who says we don't need offices. and they will be able to do it more cost effectively. Maybe they'll be able to do it with greater agility. And immediately your space, whether you wanted it or not, the, the market that you're in will be disrupted by some new entrants, some some of these firms who are doing things differently. So I think, you know, it's a really, it, it's, it's just beyond fascinating because it's probably the biggest disruption that any of us will witness to the way that we're working in our lifetime. And, um, and I think, you know, there's no doubt there's a lot of firms, especially as we go into uh, an inevitable economic slowdown, there's going to be a lot of firms who are thinking, we just want to go back to the way that things used to be. We just want to go back to the natural order of things where we understood it and, and it went well. And the challenge, of course, is that while there's the illusion that we can we can do that, we we can't return the world to the way it was back in February this year. It, it just simply won't go. When you look at surveys, about 70% of people say that they want to retain some degree of home working. Um, it's interesting because uh, around the same number of people say they want to go back to the office in some capacity. So I think broadly what we're going to get is we're, we are going to get this, this hybrid situation where people are in offices two or three days a week and then at home two or three days a week. And probably your culture, to some extent, will be defined by which days you're in the office and and how you configure that. So 
you know, I think there's a massive disruption to the way we're working. No doubt what will come from it is that some firms will retain a powerful, energizing, cohesive culture and others will feel less cohesive. They'll feel lonelier. And so it's a big opportunity for anyone right now thinking about what their firm is going to look like. Yeah, and I, I think that that kind of goes on to one of our, our future questions in, in the dialogue that we're having. The office and those concept of serendipity and all of those interactions and engagements that drive us towards culture. And those, those are important things to be able to have. And you mentioned in the book the concept of sync. I mean, sync is, is very interesting because everyone is kind of aligned and pulling in the same direction. But not only have we had the pandemic, I mean, in the last three years, in the last five years, arguably, we've had huge increases in tribalism, you know, of nationalism. And just the, I think it's taking sync to an extreme and then also getting kind of division uh, along those lines as well. How do you see sync going too far? Yeah, well, so so sync, uh, firstly, is the, the notion that when um, when humans derive far more of their energy from being in alignment and being in some sort of synchronization with other human beings. And you see this, um, it's been appropriated by armies through history who've got soldiers to march. There's been no reason for soldiers to march uh, in formation since the 1850s um, because it has no bearing on on the way that they're deployed. But um, it's an incredibly powerful tool to make soldiers behave as a single unit. And so it's why, you know, still now armies around the world spend hours drilling their troops. Um, And we observe this when, if we ask strangers to sing together or ask strangers to dance together, we observe very quickly that when we ask people how they feel about their their fellow dancers and fellow singers. They say, what lovely people, even though they've never spoken to them, they've never met them. So th- there seems to be something in humans when we feel affinity for the people that we're doing something around. And so, you know, I was very intrigued with that. You raise a really interesting point about, really about uh, identity and sort of group dynamics. And I think this is, to me, one of the, the biggest areas to watch going forward, because firstly, what do we know about identity and what do we know about group cohesion? What we know is that when identity correlates with a demographic um, aspect of population, the schisms that can form between groups can be more polarizing than the um, than than sort of typically we we feel comfortable with. Let me give you an example. When when we find voting patterns um, skew via age demographics or by ethnicity, then what what tends to happen is you know say in the United Kingdom, uh, older people tended to vote to leave the European Union and younger people tended to uh, to vote to remain. Or in the US, older people tended to vote for. Donald Trump and younger people tend to be more progressive. And what you find when you you see group dynamics like that is that it can lead. It's one of the things that historically has led to revolution and popular uprising. Now, I'm not saying it would go that far, but I do think it's something that firms need to be aware of. So, you know, it could well be that firms have got younger workers are going to increasingly feel that the political opinions of older workers are in, in intolerable you know i i don't like these people and if you then combine that with them no longer spending time together in physical proximity it could well be that firms find themselves with real schisms between their workers where younger workers feel no affinity to the older workers and don't want to collaborate with them so i think you know it's it's something to really watch i definitely think it's um you know one of the lessons of the internet I think that is going to be relevant to work is that while the tools that the internet provides us, the the ability to forge connections, I'm I'm really convinced that you can build community and you can build culture and passion through screens because uh, it's happened for the last 20 years. But one of the things that we also know is that one of the things that suffers is empathy isn't well built through screens. And so I think a, an area to watch for any organization is how can you build an empathetic organization 
when uh, maybe people aren't together all the time and, and maybe have various prejudices of why they don't trust each other. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting to see how, uh, so, so talking about empathy and just talking about digital channels and I sometimes still feel that a lot of the apps and things we're using haven't really progressed much in the last 20 years. At the same time, there's, there's on some quite other industry, when you look at the game industry, they've been trying experiments on building empathy and kind of emotional connections with the stories they tell and through that kind of medium in a variety of ways just as a, as a side note for me it's now i just started a new project uh, a good week ago so i had my first onboarding experience just through zoom that's it and i found very quickly that you know there's, there's just so many bits and pieces missing uh, let's start with just the fact that so we're looking at stakeholder mapping at the moment and Previously, I would see where people sit. I would see which people are joined in certain meetings. And therefore, I can remember more easily who they are, what they do, what group they belong to, and so on. It's now all decontextualized. It's like I'm just having people in a square. And I try to remember, so where was that again? Is he actually a coder or not? Or is he, you know, where? Because I, I have no other reference than that to it. As much as um, a couple of weeks back, we did um, a survey on working from home as well. And... As much people like their own space and the, 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 the Zoom meetings are all right, I think one of the big takeaways there as well was that uh, sort of these quick little feedback things we can get when we're in a physical space, um, they're missing a lot. Where people sort of check back on things to build trust or to get reconfirmation, you know, something that wouldn't be as big as writing an email, not as big as maybe even writing a line in Slack. Or doing a direct message right so there seems to be probably quite something missing that we're using thousands of times every day and i wonder if there's, there's there's something as an equivalent to that or which companies are actually even talking about to that level because mm -hmm. it seems yeah, to be quite I mean, absent i don't know yeah for, for me the, this whole area is an area that we've we've not like yet looked at and you know broadly back to the experience of the internet it's these things that sort of sit in the periphery, sit in the fringes. You know, I spent obviously four years at, um, at Google and then and then uh, a lot of time at Twitter. And, you know, what you discover very quickly is the things that you, you ignore because they don't feel urgent often then start to have a big bearing on just exactly, um, you know, how the organization works and, and what the organization needs to be aware of. So it's just, you know, it's um, it's obviously... A, a massive, a, a massive area for us to be thinking about going forwards because it's sitting right at the periphery of, of where we are right now, and and I suspect before we know it, it will have a, bit, a big impact on just the way our companies feel and our, the way that our organisations operate. Um, so you know, look, it's it's I, I suspect for a lot of people the the thing that they're worrying about right now is you know how can I keep my revenue going? How can I keep my my product uh, going out the door, how can I keep my sales going? And none of these things feel pressingly urgent. And I think over over a short amount of time, we're going to realize we need to be more focused on, on these areas. Okay, M moving on to a different part of the book. Um, so I, I worked for Nokia <clears throat> for a number of years. And I was in Helsinki around the time when Nokia was, was in a state of decline. Um, and without going into too big of a, of a debate about it, the, the CAS business schools got completely the wrong end of the stick, and they haven't got a clue as to why Nokia failed, because there were lots of people shouting at the management as to what actually happened. But the other thing about the whole kind of Nokia and general Nordic view of things is what I call the, the kumbaya effect. And the kumbaya effect means we all go into a room, we all come to a decision, we all hold hands and sing kumbaya, and no single person has a voice. There is no single leader and no one singly made a decision. So we all either succeed together or we all sort of fail together. And that was in such stark contrast to, to Steve Jobs, who was absolutely charismatic and it was lead, follow, or get out of the way. And I think there are a whole lot of people that actually are drawn to that. And to a, to a negative extent, there's a whole lot of people that are drawn to, to Donald Trump because he is indeed this big, charismatic leader voice. So 
Um, can you talk a bit more about, you know, how, how certain are we that we, there should never be a single charismatic voice? I mean, Donald Trump, a wrong voice. Steve Jobs, usually the right voice, but not always. Yeah, I've, I've got, you know, quite often um, strong charismatic voices can be important for trying to drive through something with um, and having a focal point for them. You know, I... I and, and they don't always have to be like classically strong or, or classically charismatic. If you think, you know, I, I was a member of Greenpeace when I was in my teenage years. And one of the challenges that the ecology movement has had over the last two decades is it has had no focal point of, of interest. And actually, you know, the arrival of, arrival of Greta Thunberg, albeit, you know, she's not remotely... Um, she's not remotely your classical archetypal... Uh, charismatic leader has actually provided a focal point and, and has driven that movement on far more than um, than it's been able to in the last few years. So, you know, um, sometimes there can be a very important talismanic manic factor. My feeling was more, though, that um, in every every organisation I've been that has had good culture, I found that the culture wasn't just down to one person. It was down to a... Um, a, a series of individuals making collective choices. So I think that was the point that I, I sort of was making there, that just um, we shouldn't believe that one person owns the culture in an organisation. And my feeling was very strongly that there were times when I was in organisations where interventions that were made by junior people actually were as powerful. So I remember going to uh, where, when I started doing my podcast and when I started writing my book, um, I remember being invited into one organization and they said to me, oh, our receptionist changed the culture here. And I was like, it was fascinating. I was intrigued by that because, you know, we often don't hear of low status people um, being able to transform organizations. But she was able to speak clearly. And I guess they had a degree of open mindedness to what she was saying. And she'd helped them make a more um, a sort of more cohesive, a more connected culture. So, I, you know, I'm not necessarily against the the driving factor of, of a charismatic or a powerful leader, and they often can can make things happen. But um, but I, I I just think sometimes that that solution alone is not the only answer. Yeah, I think that's it's 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 one of those. Yeah, it's it's really interesting because I think. There's, there's, there's other elements to that as well. So uh, it's interesting what you say. It, I, th I think you're absolutely right when you say it's not always the solution. But, you know, we're currently having a couple of other things going on. For example, the conversation about self-organizing teams, which they are never quite leaderless. The other thing is also about prioritizing work. And when you look at um, uh, people working remotely from home and less with people around them to maybe tell them or remind them of what we should be doing next. They have to be more self-activating, right? So the, 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 the really phenomenon I came across a lot of times, and I'm reflecting here a little bit on sort of what service design is doing or design thinking, which always drives the idea of being collaborative, is that when you suddenly really have many people in the room and like Troy said this kind of kumbaya effect it becomes very tricky to evaluate who actually has a fact and who has just an opinion and I've been in just so many hours of meetings where everyone has had just an opinion there's no real model to assess well that angle sort of is more valuable than this and don't you don't you and it's great to be in an environment where you can challenge right we want to have challenges we want to we want to uh, create everything as an assumption and bring pro proof to the table to make better decisions but where to start and is is how big is the risk that we 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 we, we have sometimes then people going like oh challenging is a thing so i'm going to challenge for the sake of challenging and it starts to really become a dynamic that we maybe not want to do how can we stay sort of still focused accurate bring facts to the table and and be able to somewhat evaluate and um prioritize which of the two three ideas we have we do because there's probably three thousand things to do so how, how do you yeah. how do we balance all these voices and and, and and the values behind them i guess broadly what you're saying is that you know i'd be intrigued because 
the notion that people challenge for the sake of challenging is an intriguing one because it suggests that we um, we consider people to be naturally disruptive. The, the best example I can give on that is that the researcher and professor, Amy Edmondson, did some really wonderful work about psychological safety. So psychological safety is this, this idea that we can speak candidly to each other and that we can all... Um, we can all sort of work in service of being honest to each other and, and, and telling our real feelings. And she gave some, uh, anyone who's interested, I, I cover it at great length, but she, she wrote some really interesting academic papers on these things. So in one of them, she, she looked at operating teams who'd just introduced a new form of open heart surgery. So to be specific, the way that open heart surgery used to work is that um, our rib cage was was literally opened, you know, it was sort of split open and that, and our heart was operated on. And then about 15 years ago, a new form of open heart surgery that was, in, was introduced, which involved um, going up through your leg. And so what happened was Amy Edmondson tracked the implementation of this across multiple hospitals and multiple operating teams. And what she discovered was that there was a fundamental difference in the teams that succeeded. Um, what generally happened was the leader in the teams, the teams that succeeded and ended up making a success of the new operation would have patterns of behavior that were very different. So the, the lead surgeon would say, how's everyone feeling about this? Is there anything that you think I need to be doing differently? And one of the, one of the examples there was that one of the things that used to happen was that everyone in the surgical team could see um what was happening you know the big incision so you could everyone could see in the new version no one could see and so by him or her asking that question um very quickly it became clear that they needed to introduce a camera where everyone could see what the surgeon was seeing okay that was interesting the the surgeons who didn't have that psychological psychological safety didn't spend a moment asking their teams um what they found, they they found like questions to be disruptive. They found, you know, disagreements for the sake of disagreements. And they pressed on and they effectively, um, they had a different outcome. So the way that Amy Edmondson categorizes it is she said the teams that had one of these surgeons who would try and teach it, treat it like a team concern, a team pursuit, quite often they would be in a situation where after five or six operations, they would be asking for more complex patients. And the teams who had the surgeon who was like the, the expert, the master of the universe, the, um, the sort of the fearless leader, after five or six operations, they would report, they found the whole procedure to be too difficult and they gave up. And so I guess, you know, it's an important reminder to us that sometimes teams don't ask questions just to be difficult. And if they are, it's probably a symptom of something else. Rather more, um, teams are trying to be heard and they're trying to feel like they're making a contribution. And sometimes we consider that to be an annoyance. And we have to ask ourselves, why are we being annoyed by it, really? Yeah, and I think maybe that gets us to something around uh, that I've been looking at and we had at some projects, let's say, um, in change and transformation around, for example, a project I work at BT and all that HSBC to some extent, extent and nationwide. So quite a lot of last couple of my projects they started to really deal with sort of a shift in governance you know if 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 your if if your role and purpose in a team is to push a decision or make a decision or bring a decision back to someone superior or higher up then those people tend to be sort of influencing the decision making and the contributions towards how to make a decision differently to the point where it seems that they think if they don't say anything, they don't have a purpose here. And if they don't have a purpose here, you know, they might lose their job or they're not contributing any value. And uh, so do you think generally this kind of shift of governance is sort of a necessary reassessment of things like when you have product owners or team team managers and those those kind of roles, responsibilities? Is there something we should rather all of us more pick up and therefore, you know, a team by itself can just decide who's going to report back rather than it's always that one person that reports back to whoever they need to report back and those kind of things. 
what, what are you what are your thoughts yeah, on that? There's an interesting one. I, I was reading. I, I chatted on my podcast to um, a professor called uh, Gary Hamill this week. He's from London Business School, and um, and he was talking about the the one of the challenges that so much of our work these days is bureaucratic that we have managers who report to managers we have leaders who report to leaders and the end result of this is that um is, is that there's just layers of bureaucracy and i think you know his point is if we start trying to get rid of some of that bureaucracy the job and our workers are far more capable and, and our jobs are far more uh enjoyable than we believe so you know I'm, I'm intrigued by that idea really um so moving on to kind of our, our last question because we are indeed running out of time um i've been talking about this for for a number of years and one of the things we like to do on the wicked podcast is try to give people actual real kind of actionable insights things they can do immediately um there was a guy called mikitani um and he had the the rule of three and ten and you said at the very beginning of the show that you joined Twitter when there were around 300 people and then kind of grew. And that 300 is kind of a magic number because the rule of three and 10 says that things change at multiples of threes of the size of the organization and powers of 10. So what worked with 30 employees doesn't work with 90. What worked with 100 doesn't work with 1,000. So as you have been in part of these organizations and seen them grow and grow through that, um, and you bring in the concept of having good sync, having people be aligned, having people you know, enjoying the work that they're doing. What other things can you see as organizations go and they grow through the three, multiple of three and the power of 10? Yeah, I mean, look, it sa sounds intriguing to me. It sounds, um, yeah, it, it sounds, uh, yeah, I, I've never quite seen that, but it's uh, it's impressive. It's impressive, you know, it's sort of, interesting that he says it but yet there, there seems to be some degree of truth uh there seems to be some degree of truth that you know any of us who've dealt with with um with organizations changing absolutely the the connections between individuals do seem to transform over time and as organizations get bigger okay that's yeah, really it's a it's a complex subject isn't it um mm. Just looking at the time, unfortunately, Bruce, it was really lovely to talk to. There's tons more in the book that we unfortunately didn't have time to reflect upon and talk about. But uh, at this point, just uh, I want to thank you for your time. Really interesting. Uh, great book to dive into. And so thank you. thank you for your time. Thank you. So grateful to talk to you. And have a great week. Thank you. You've been listening to The Wicked Podcast with co-hosts Marcus Kirsch and me, Troy Norcross. Please subscribe on Podomatic, iTunes, or Spotify. You can find all relevant links in the show notes. Please tell us your thoughts in the comment section and let us know about any books for future episodes. You can also get in touch with us directly on Twitter on at Wicked and Beyond or at Troy underscore Norcross. Also, learn more about the Wicked Company book and the Wicked Company project at wickedcompany.com.